five. The humanitarian corridors. Guess where they led to, Halligan? All paths lead to Moscow. <laughs> Four. We simply haven't taken Russia seriously enough and haven't taken Putin seriously enough. Three. We're so fortunate our public finances are in such good shape as we enter this period of unprecedented turmoil. Sounds like we're going to end up living off grid, co-pilot. You're going to be hunting squirrels and I'll be making a squirrel lasagna. I'm pretty handy with a bivouac. One. <laughs> we have lift off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Well, co-pilot, this is obviously a military war between Russia and Ukraine, but there's the related parallel conflict, an economic war between Russia and the West. There are no NATO boots on the ground, and I don't think we'll see US and British planes enforcing a no-fly zone anytime soon, despite both Boris Johnson and US President Joe Biden coming under pressure to do so. But the West has responded to... Vladimir Putin's aggressive invasion, understandably, with unprecedented sanctions on the Russian economy. And Russia is now retaliating with economic sanctions in kind. You've been rightly focusing this week on the military and humanitarian implications of this ghastly Russia-Ukraine war, Alison, as well as writing a stirring piece after the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, gave a moving video link address to our own parliament. And the link to your latest column is in the show notes to this episode of Planet Normal. I've been looking at the East-West economic war, the implications of which, in my view, are being grossly underestimated. The Russian economy is barely in the world's top 10, as Western politicians so often point out. But when it comes to exports of energy, foodstuff, industrial metals and a host of other commodities, Russia is a superpower. With the Kremlin, the White House and Downing Street now determined to stop a host of Russian exports flowing to global markets, we could be in for a serious dose of 1970s-style inflation. Crikey, co-pilot, I know they say history repeats, but I didn't expect to rerun a big chunk of the whole 20th century in just a few short weeks. (laughs) I was just thinking, Liam... Isn't it lucky we didn't make any unwise, vast expenditure over the past two years? So the UK has got this healthy war chest to weather the turbulent times ahead. We're so fortunate our public finances are in (laughs) such good shape as we enter this period of unprecedented turmoil. (laughs) I was trying to find an elegant way of framing this, but I thought I'd ask my learned co-pilot, how stuffed are we? Like most people, not like you, like most people, I don't think of energy from one year to the next, except when a few bills land. But it's now sinking into me, not least reading your excellent columns, price of gas through the roof. I mean, the price of energy was going through the roof anyway before the war. We're told that household bills will skyrocket more than they already had. I've seen talk of £3,000 a year. I'm quite angry, Liam, to be honest. I think this is what happens when you rely on imported energy. I think we've had the world leadership has been in the sort of virtue signalling coma. And so now we are facing, as you say, this horrendous energy crisis. I read that forecast household incomes could fall faster at any time since records began in 1955. We seem to be looking at the most difficult economic year, maybe in our lifetimes. Is recession inevitable, co-pilot? I wouldn't say it's inevitable because the global economy is still in the middle of this great unlocking from the COVID pandemic. There is somewhere in the background still the faint outline of a V-shaped recovery. That's why the Treasury official forecast for economic growth this year remains at 6%, which is very, very chunky indeed. But we're not going to get anywhere near that. I think it'd be more like 1% or 2% if we do avoid recession because, of course, We're now coming to realise, as we have these tit-for-tat sanctions between Russia and the West, the US banning Russian energy exports to as much of the Western world as it can influence, not quite the EU yet, let's see. And Russia in turn saying, well, we're not going to sell you any potash or any other stuff you need to make fertiliser, so we're going to stitch you up in terms of 
the cost of growing food, even if you grow food in the UK, even if you don't allow your shipping lines to bring wheat from Russia, which we are the largest exporter of. Look, you and I talked ages ago, didn't we, about a possible return to the 1970s, a sort of spring rising or a winter of discontent. You were the cheery harbinger of doom all that time ago. I mean, how long have you been saying the word fertiliser to me? It was back in August that I first started to talk along these lines because mm. I could see lots of inflation in the pipeline and I could see a concerted attempt by Western central banks to say, don't worry about inflation, it's only transitory. So I knew that they must know something too because they were starting their sort of coordinated raft of backspin if you like. Already food prices were going up, already energy prices were going up, already, as you mentioned, the off-gem energy price cap was due to rise, and we know it's going to rise in April, the household price cap on average energy bills to almost £2,000 a year, up from about £1,300 a year, 700 quid increase, which is proper money. That's a lot of cash for lots of households to find. But that was before we had these sanctions and counter sanctions, really astonishing turmoil on global commodity markets, not just oil and gas, but also wheat, grain, nickel prices spiking upwards, so much so that trading was suspended on the London Metals Exchange earlier this week. Who cares about nickel? Well, you use nickel to make stainless steel, Alison. You use nickel to make turbines. You use nickel to make the batteries that fuel electric cars. So lots of these Industrial metals like titanium, palladium, aluminium. Russia exports this stuff in huge volumes. Even in Soviet days, those flows kept going. The global economy kept going in that sense with serious exports from the Soviet Union. And even more now, given the extent we've integrated our economies over the last 30 or years or so since the Soviet Union collapsed, we're now seeing the implications of those sanctions. Don't get me wrong. Of course, we need to counter Putin's aggression. Of course, we need to stand up for Ukraine, which in this case is the party that was attacked rather than the party that did the attacking. But it's a very important part of the analysis as we manage this war between Russia and and Ukraine as we try and deal with the implications that the parallel east-west economic conflict, and it is full on economic conflict when we're trying to sanction Russia's central bank so they can't access their reserves to defend their currency as domestic savings are wiped out across many Russian households. It is economic war. That is going to have implications on our living standards. It's not enough to stand at a dispatch box and say, oh, you might need to pay a little bit more for your shopping. We're not talking about buying organic bananas rather than normal bananas. We're talking about companies across the red wall that use lots and lots of energy being wiped out and their employees not having a job anymore. We're talking about people that have to fill up their vans and cars for work paying 50% more or more than that for their fuel going forward. We're talking about not just energy security, but also food security. So yes, we need to impose sanctions, but we need to think through very, very carefully and at the very least recognize and try and counter the impact of these sanctions on millions of British households. I found a nice little thing for you. I thought you'd like this. Thanks to a big jump in the price of commodities, a five cent coin can now be melted down into 8.7 cents worth of copper and nickel. So the metal, Liam, is now worth 74% more than the coin itself. How strange is that? And what is that a harbinger of? You tell me with your vast economics brain. There's something very odd going on, isn't there? Well, when the Romans started printing lots of money and expanding their money supply, people literally used to nick bits of precious metal off the coins. That's where the word debasing comes from. Oh, right, really? You're kind of undermining the coinage by stealing parts of it because the raw material is worth more than what the coin represents in terms of the currency that you've created. Yes, in terms of dollars, the Russian economy is a relatively small, big economy, if you like, outside the top 10 now, because, of course, the ruble means that the ruble-denominated Russian economy in dollars is worth a lot less. So clever economists can draw up spreadsheets showing that 
Russia is now a smaller economy than not just the UK, but also Spain and Italy and so on. But if you value not dollars or coinage, of course, of which we've expanded the supply of greatly. But if you look in terms of oil, gas, those precious metals, those industrial metals, gold, land, water, timber, agricultural output, Russia is an incredibly wealthy place, even if its people are having a very hard time at the moment because of these Western sanctions. So we have to be mindful, as I say, and I'll get it in the neck for saying it, but I'm pointing out economic realities here that our politicians need to understand and prepare the population for. There will be very significant economic fallout from these sanctions going forward. It's not just about paying more when you fill up your car or van, though that is at the moment the most visible implication. We're approaching two pounds a litre for petrol and diesel in some parts of the country at the moment. It was less than one pound fifty on average just a couple of weeks ago. But I had a really interesting conversation with a couple of farmers and they are seriously concerned about food security because fertilizer now, rather than two or three hundred quid a tonne, is a thousand pounds a tonne, which is a huge increase in farmers' cost base. And of course, farmers also use a lot of fuel driving all that heavy machinery. It takes a lot of fuel. So even if we do want to switch towards domestic food production more to enhance our food security, which I think we will after this astonishing series of events between Russia and Ukraine, to try and do that now, it will still be really, really expensive once that food gets to the shops because the cost base, even of our domestic farmers, is much, much higher now than it was just a couple of weeks ago. I found out, Liam, that we import a lot of our diesel and heating oil from Russia So those prices are going to soar. And that's very bad news, as you say, isn't it, for rural areas where a lot of people rely on heating oil. And there is a new energy supply paper in the next few weeks. And as I said, I'm just fuming, really. I think the lack of planning for our energy security has been criminally bad. We've had this gung-ho, let's switch to green renewables, run down our freely available sources of oil and coal, fail to build any new nuclear power stations, while virtue signalling that will hit net zero by 2050. Fingers crossed, chaps. I mean, it's all been hubris and delusion, Liam. And I suppose I do sometimes look around our country and I think, is there any actual leadership going on? Are there any people working away at these projections to see what happens if there was a war with Russia? What would we do? And honestly, I just don't think that there is this planning. And now, of course, they're talking about how to ease reliance on Russian energy because bills are soaring Boris is talking about quicker adoption of these small modular nuclear reactors you've talked about on the podcast before. Fracking, well, they were going to seal two gas shale wells, pour concrete down them in the next week in Lancashire with cement to seal them up. And they've been reprieved now, largely due to a backlash from Lord Frost, former Planet Normal guest and various Tory MPs. So it seems to me almost reluctantly now, they're being forced to have this absolutely drastic change of course. You and I sometimes knock the civil service, Alison, don't we? But there are many excellent, smart, forward-looking, courageous analysts within the civil service. And I'm pleased to say I know quite a few of them and I talk to them off and on, as I know you do as well. The civil service will have produced endless papers about energy security that are completely on the money, to coin a phrase, that do warn about these things. But a lot of politicians and special advisors, they just wave them away because they're more worried about chasing the next headline or following the next focus group rather than leading. I would say when it comes to things like fracking and net zero, there's a lot more votes for the Tories to be gained across the red wall by easing up on net zero and going back towards more conventional energy and providing lots of industrial jobs by fracking than there is in terms of challenging the Lib Dems in leafy seats in Western South London by 
being greener than green. So I think that's a calculation going on in the mind of the Prime Minister and others close to the top of the Conservative Party. But I'd also say that I agree with you that we have made some really mad decisions. Why did we not replace the massive gas storage facility that we've had at Rough off the Yorkshire coast? Why do we have so little gas storage in this country? Why do we think it's okay to contract out our gas storage to the Dutch and the Germans as we have? And also, I wanted to correct something, and that's a hard word, correct, but it is correcting something because I keep listening to ministers standing at the dispatch box saying, oh, we only use 3% or 4% of our gas comes from Russia. That's just economically illiterate because it's a global market for gas and everyone buys off the global market. So the gas price everywhere is more expensive, whether you use 60% of your gas from Russia or 2% or 5% of your gas from Russia. And when you're putting sanctions on exports from the biggest exporter of energy in the world, if you combine oil and gas, then that is going to put prices up. And that's what's happening. And actually, because we haven't got that much gas storage, and because we have a relatively small supply now of nuclear energy, it's less than 20%. And we're quite a long way, Hinkley points happening, but we're quite a long way from replacing a lot of the long standing nuclear power stations that are in the process of being decommissioned or will be decommissioned soon. And those Rolls Royce small modular reactors, they are still with the best will in the world, quite a long way off. Yes, the technology in principle exists because it's the same technology we use in nuclear submarines. And it's surely a great idea to have smaller nuclear reactors that are more nimble and can be built at scale much more cheaply because of repetitive processes. But all that is a long way away. And the problem now is that the Western world the US, the UK, we're scrambling around trying to fill the 11 million barrels of oil or so each day that the Russians pump. They use about three or four million barrels of that themselves. They obviously have quite a big industrial economy, but they pump seven to eight million barrels onto global markets every day. And some of those will obviously be diverted to China. As we've said in the past, there are now oil and gas pipelines between Russia and China. They've been built under Putin's rule. The building of each pipeline sort of coincides with the latest spat with the West. So the oil one was built at the time of the Georgia conflict. And then the gas pipeline to China was built at the time of crisis over Crimea. But we are now looking around, making nice with the Iranians, making nice with the Venezuelans, who not so long ago, Nicolas Maduro there, was throwing US diplomats out of Caracas, out of the country. And so we can say, oh, we can look for LNG gas from Qatar. That's liquefied natural gas that you put on ships. But, you know, Qatar is to the west of the Gulf of Hormuz. The last time I looked, that pinch point of global energy that's controlled by Iran. So we really are in a situation where we are vulnerable to this. And at the very least, if anything positive is going to come out of this ghastly, ghastly invasion by the Russians, with, of course, all the awful military and humanitarian fallout from that, which is always at the front and center of our minds, even as we analyze the economics and the real politic and the geopolitics of the situation, then maybe what's happening now will jolt this generation of Western leaders to actually grow up a little bit and think about real issues that matter to real people, not just soft issues, culture war issues that a lot of the public thinks are pretty meaningless. I know the political media elite is obsessed with them, but of far more importance is the provision of basic necessities, fuel, food, a decent standard of living to the vast bulk of your population and, of course, helping the poor and the vulnerable who can't always help themselves. We've got to get back to our knitting co-pilot. We've got to get back to basics, to use John Major's phrase, but I'm talking about the real economic basics. And if this awful Russia-Ukraine conflict creates anything good, hopefully that'll be it. Sounds like we're going to end up living off-grid, co-pilot. You're going to be hunting squirrels and I'll be making squirrel lasagna. We'll survive somehow. I'm pretty handy with a bivouac. (laughs) 
can imagine. I was thinking, Liam, that we've there's always that stuff about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I was thinking, well, we've had plague, flood and war. Famine's the only one left in the stable. So no doubt he'll come cantering out soon. As you say, there are these different strands to the war, to the conflict. We've just been talking about the economic and the geopolitical fallout. But of course, the hour by hour thing that people are being subject to is this absolutely horrific humanitarian catastrophe. Two million refugees have left Ukraine in two weeks. Millions more are trapped in under heavy bombardment. I don't know what you think. It seemed to me that Putin probably thought it was going to be a bit of a walk in the park, now getting angry and frustrated by lack of progress. We had a really dark sort of Batman villain twist this week when the Russians were saying to the Ukrainians they could have these humanitarian corridors out of Sumy and Irpin and Mariupol. And then it turned out, did you see this, that the humanitarian corridors, guess where they led to, Halligan? <laughs> yeah, all paths lead to Moscow. All paths lead, yes, yes. It's kind of like this arsonist has blown up your house. You now offered a free birth in the matches factory. I mean, thanks, but no thanks. There have been many, many strong photographs from the war so far by some great photojournalists. There's one by a photographer for the New York Times, which made a lot of the front pages absolutely devastating. A mother and two children lying dead on a pavement in a pin and their two little terriers, Liam, were howling beside them, this little tiny triptych of a family, the little girl pink rucksack with some blood on it. I mean, just unbelievable, just lying there dead. And yesterday I was reading up and the mum was called Tatiana Peribenos and she was the head of accountancy at an IT firm. The family had previously fled violence in the Donetsk region. That's obviously the one of the contested regions in the east, which will probably end up being handed back to Russia. And there she was, cut down with her children, Elise, nine, and Nikita, 18, lovely young man, similar age to some of our kids. And this is what a tragedy, unspeakable tragedy for a family who two weeks ago were having coffee, getting the kids out of bed for school. So I think that with all the sort of global negotiations about this and all the soaring prices, and then you have Little families like that just absolutely destroyed by this monstrous, monstrous aggression. I I was thinking, Liam, something we mentioned last week about the solution. Now, President Zelensky, I, I did write my column this week about the fantastic, inspiring address that he gave to MPs in the House of Commons on Tuesday afternoon. It was very moving. Both your column and, of course, the speech. It was extremely. It was really something. But there they all are, sitting on the green benches, you know, inevitably comfortable, sitting in London. And there's Zelensky, former comedian, sitcom star, must be living on borrowed time, really. And he was reciting just a simple diary of the shattering events of the previous 13 days, which began when the first cruise missiles hit Ukraine. And he said... The war we didn't start and didn't want, just as you didn't want to lose your country when the Nazis started fighting. And I think that that really struck home to me. There was a time in the mid-1940s when we too once stood alone against overwhelming odds, praying for help to come. And he was reciting this litany of horrors quite quietly, Zelensky, attacks on children, hospitals, but that didn't break us. And the the, the translator who was translating for Parliament, he was struggling to keep up with him, and he said that gave us feeling of big truth. It was a touchingly awkward translation of what Zelensky had said, but I thought, yeah, that gave us feeling of big truth, and you thought, too damn true, really. And then, of course, he went on to adapt Winston Churchill's great On the Beaches speech, we'll fight in the sea and the air, we'll fight in forest fields and on our shores, we'll fight on the land and in the streets, we'll fight on the banks of our rivers of Dnieper, which is the river which is running through Kiev now. And, he, of course, he ended up by thanking the British people, and by thanking, we are grateful to you, Boris, which is rather at odds, co-pilot, isn't it, with some of the sniping 
that's been coming from the media and the Labour Party saying that the UK hasn't been doing enough, not been compassionate enough. And, and I dug up a lot of material this week. So the British public has raised £120 million, pounds, Liam, for Ukraine in just five days. Fantastic effort, people collecting toiletries, canned goods, baby formula. And the British government has sent £400 million to the Ukraine government, but also these astonishing quantities of lethal aid, weaponry. And I was able this week to be in contact with Penny Mordaunt, former guest on the planet Normal Rocket, also former defence minister and co-pilot. She was filling me in on the amazing support that the British military has been giving to troops in Ukraine since 2015, after the illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia in 2014. And it's absolutely amazing. More than 20,000 troops, Ukrainians, trained by the British military, capacity building, counter IEDs, counter sniping. We've seen a couple of Russian generals picked off in the last 10 days, haven't we? Well, the men pulling those triggers were probably trained by our guys. So I felt, I don't know about you, I felt pretty proud. And our guys can't go and stand side by side by those guys, but we are providing the weapons and the extraordinary technology. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this and click follow so you don't miss an update. The UK has been lucky, Alison, to have had some pretty impressive ambassadors to Moscow over recent decades. The first one I ever met was Sir Roderick Braithwaite, who was running the British Embassy on the banks of the River Moskva as the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s. Busy day at work. And he remains a savvy observer of Putin's Russia to this day. Among Sir Roderick's successors is Sir Tony Brenton, who was our ambassador in Russia from 2004 to 2008. Sir Tony's met Vladimir Putin on numerous occasions. And like Sir Roderick, he remains a widely respected Russia analyst. I invited Sir Tony to Planet Normal and I started by asking him the same question I asked the former head of British intelligence, Sir Richard Dearlove, last week. Is he surprised, when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, that we are where we are? Yes, I am. And the big change, of course, has been in Putin himself. I mean, there have been other changes in Russia since I left there. But the Putin whom I knew was a very cautious contained, calculating individual. He's not a buddy or a hell fellow well met, but he always thought rather hard about the risks he was taking and the responses that he made to them. And you know, he did take risks, of course. He did seize Crimea back in 2014. He did back Bashar al-Assad when we, the West, were intent on removing him. But those were both actions which were contained in their likely wider effects in the world. This attack on Ukraine is a huge, huge risk for Russia, as in fact I think we are actually seeing, completely unquantifiable in the damage it could do. And again, I think we're beginning to see that now, and is not the sort of thing that the Putin I knew would ever have done. Back in your era, if you like, when you were heading up the British diplomatic service in Russia, I remember that time well. I spent quite a lot of time in Russia during that period. Putin was appointing people to his government who were building the credibility of Russian economics and finance. The finance minister, Alexei Kudrin, was particularly well regarded around the world. He was distancing himself from the chaos of the end of the Soviet Union And Russia at that time was attracting huge amounts of foreign direct investment, as you'll remember. 
all that's now reversed. All that seems to have now dissolved. Do you not think he'll be concerned to have lost yes. that? Well, yes, obviously he will. I mean, you're absolutely right. Alexei Kudrin, whom I got to know quite well, was a very effective professional economist who steered the Russian economy for a long time, I think pretty close on a decade, and steered it sensibly. At the beginning of that time, in particular, Russia was enjoying economic growth of about 8% a year. And as you say, huge amounts of Western investment were pouring in, most particularly actually from the UK. Both BP and Shell had vast investments in the Russian oil sector. And we were for a time the largest Western investor in Russia. Now, Putin, as I said, has changed. He has become much more hostile to the West for a variety of reasons, which we may well find ourselves going into. But I think that one of the key things that has changed in him is that he has become much less attentive to economic matters and to the broad prosperity of the Russian population, and much more concerned about security threats to Russia, which he sees as coming from the West. So in a way, his regime has become more Spartan, more concerned with military and security matters, and much less concerned with the economic welfare of the ordinary Russian. You all know, Sir Tony, that when the Soviet Union collapsed, Vladimir Putin quite quickly began working with a very reform-minded mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. He first came to the British government's attention, I'm sure, back in the early 90s when he was drumming up foreign investment for St. Petersburg. He seems now to have reverted to type in some sense. What do you think's happened to him? And do you think future historians will conclude this is partly of the West's doing? Well, I'm afraid they will. I mean, I don't want to say the West was entirely responsible for it. Russia is a difficult country with a rather thin record of uh, democracy, which basically lasted for as long as Yeltsin was president, and with a deep chip on its shoulder about its defeat in the Cold War. But all of that said, since Yeltsin was president back in the 1990s, they have been very concerned about their security, and in particular, about the expansion of our alliance, NATO. And this isn't just Putin. Yeltsin was already complaining to the West about Western plans to expand NATO back in the mid-1990s and believed at the time, and indeed Gorbachev before Yeltsin, believed at the time that they had, if not assurances from the West, then at least broad hints from the West that NATO would not be expanded in a way that looked as if it threatened Russian security. Now, those hints, whatever you like to call them, have evidently not been lived up to. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO has acquired 14 new members. It now has a population based of about a billion people, and it spends about 10 times as much as Russia does on its defence. So the Russians in any case feel threatened. But to add insult to injury, if I can put it that way, Ukraine, which is a very special country from Russia's point of view, it's a, a Slavic little brother. I don't know a, a Russian who doesn't have a Ukrainian dacha or doesn't spend his holidays in Ukraine or doesn't have some close family links with Ukraine. And Ukraine itself is now talking very actively about joining NATO. NATO is talking quite enthusiastically about taking it in when it's ready. And from Putin's point of view, this is outrageous. This is, as I say, in Putin's view, an integral part of the Slavic world, a country which really ought to be part of Russia, being taken over by what he regards as a deeply hostile organisation. And he's been pretty clear several times that he's not going to let it happen. We, the West, chose to ignore him. And that's an important part of the background to where we now are. So, Tony, you and I, highly educated, well, in your case anyway, Western people with a deep professional interest in Russia, we could sit around, couldn't we, in senior common rooms in learned institutions and have a detailed discussion about the list of grievances and Western and Russian perspectives on the idea of NATO expansion. But it strikes me that it's impossible to have those discussions now. It's impossible to put forward anything of the Russian perspective, however legitimate that perspective may be, because Putin has been so aggressive and the humanitarian fallout from this brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine is now so much to the fore of public consciousness. Yes, no, that's right. And let me just say two, I think, quite important things. Firstly, I think Putin has become, not only over the last year or so, really quite unbalanced on the issue of Ukraine joining NATO. 
Yes, it's a blow to Russia's self-esteem, to Russia's view of how the Slavic world ought to be and all of that. But Putin has moved it to front and center of his relationship with the West in a way which is quite disproportionate to the challenge that it poses. That's the first thing. The second thing I should say is that, yes, we've ignored him. Yes, we haven't taken him seriously enough. But that really doesn't justify what he is now doing to Ukraine. This is a brutal war of aggression. And it is absolutely right that the West, whatever its past sins, responds to this entirely supporting Ukraine, as indeed we are. Indeed. When we look back, though, even George Kennan, the architect of post-war US foreign policy, one of the most influential influences in American policymaking in the back half of the 20th century, he wrote in 1997, didn't he, famously in the New York Times after visiting Russia, that it would be, quote, a fateful error if the West insisted on expanding NATO, particularly across Ukraine, right up to Russia's southern border. What's driven our absolute determination in the face of all concerns to expand NATO the way we have? We simply haven't taken Russia seriously enough and haven't taken Putin seriously enough. After the Soviet collapse in 1991, Russia was economically extremely weak, militarily in security terms, also extremely weak. At that time, I'm afraid the United States in particular made it an active project to take advantage of Russian weakness and to build up NATO. And that policy has been maintained in the teeth of, yes, George Kennan was absolutely right. Other people have said corresponding things about how dangerous this policy was. Margaret Thatcher wrote to Gorbachev in 1985. So before the reform process really got going, and what she said to him was, we know that you are as entitled as we are to feel secure. She understood that a peaceful Europe depended upon Europe's major powers feeling secure. And unfortunately, we have not lived up to that. Russia has made it clear that the expansion of NATO undermined its sense of security, and we're now paying the price for that. So yeah, we bear a lot of responsibility for what happened. So Tony, you are a very distinguished former diplomat. You speak Arabic, you speak pretty good Russian. I've seen you in action, as it were. You're very much of the Foreign Office, and yet you venture views which are much broader, and in my view, more accurate about the situation. Do you ever get a hard time, if I may say so, from your former Foreign Office colleagues for the kind of discussion we're having now? No, actually. I mean, the Foreign Office <laughs> is a very friendly club-like organisation. I mean, we have friendly disagreements. And when I disagree with British policy, I say so. And they will argue with me. And the Foreign Office, I have to say, is also full of very intelligent, perceptive analysts. Far more often than not, there are good reasons for British policy being what it is. But occasionally, I see better reasons for our behaving differently. I think, well, we've just had a discussion about one area where I think we, the UK, have been too ready to go along with a mistaken policy, which is the policy of continuing to expand NATO in the teeth of Russian objections. How do you read the Russia-China relationship, again, during your period in the British Embassy in Moscow, 2004 to 2008, the long-term suspicion between Russia and China was thawing. The economic synergy between the world's biggest energy importer, as it became, and the world's biggest energy exporter became clear. Towards the end of your period in office, if you like, Russia and China signed the East Siberia Pacific Ocean oil pipeline deal, a pipeline that's now been built along with another huge gas pipeline from Russia to China. How important is China's behaviour to Russia, would you say, Sir Tony, in terms of allowing Putin to maintain his current course of action? I think it's very important. I take some modest professional pride in being one of the very early people to draw the Foreign Office's attention to the significance of this. I mean, the Russia-China relationship is not a natural one in lots of ways. Absolutely. They've had a pretty rough history together. Russia took over large chunks of China during China's century of humiliation in the 19th century. There's some competition for influence in what Russia regards as its backyard in Central Asia. And there are, of course, huge civilizational differences between them. It's quite clear to me that the Russians, given the free choice, would far rather align themselves with the West in what pretty clearly is an upcoming confrontation between China and the West than with China. Nevertheless, 
there are some things that pull them together. There's a natural economic complementarity. Russia is a huge producer of gas and oil and other raw materials. China is a huge consumer of them. And conversely, China is a huge producer of manufactured products and Russia is a huge consumer of them. So there's an economic link. And the other clear attraction between them is that they have a 2,000 mile shared border, which both of them would vastly prefer not to have to massively defend. Indeed, Russia has moved a lot of troops to Ukraine from its border with China as part of the current conflagration. But the thing that is really pushing them together is the West's hostility on the one hand to China and the West's hostility to Russia with its concerns about the expansion of NATO and all that. And that external pressure is pushing them harder and harder together. And I think that Putin, as he has thought about this war he has now launched, has probably been reasonably confident because he did, of course, discuss this with Xi before the Chinese Winter Olympics when he was over in Beijing, that to the extent that China is able to help Russia dealing with sanctions, taking up the slack in Russia exports of gas and oil without damaging China's own interests with the West, he's reasonably hopeful that China will do that and that it will help to cushion Russia against the Western reaction to the war in Ukraine, which we're now seeing. You will have poured over, as I did, the voting tally, if you like, at the United Nations, a motion condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine, in which China famously abstained and also the Indians abstained. What's going on? India famously thinks of itself as non-aligned, thinks of itself as being a rising great power on its own account, which deals with other great powers on relationships of increasing equality, and a country which is uncomfortable with a world which is dominated by a single great power, the United States for the moment, with China rising. India also has the problem that it has very vexed relations with China itself. So maintaining a civilized relationship with Russia, who is another player in that big league, is a rather natural thing for them to want to do. They also, it has to be said, depend heavily on Russia for a lot of their arms imports. Fascinating stuff. What's an optimistic scenario here? Do you think we can get back to some kind of solution, some kind of resolution along the lines of the so-called Minsk protocols of 2014-15, some kind of autonomy, some kind of power sharing in eastern Ukraine, keeping it within the Ukrainian nation? Or do you think we've now come so far and Putin has been so heavy handed that any hope that we can get back to the kind of Minsk agreement ideas that the French and the Germans were pushing before this invasion, do you think that ship has now sailed? I'm afraid I find it very difficult to be optimistic. I guess the one hopeful thing that's going on are these talks between the Ukrainians and the Russians with rather low-level negotiators on both sides, which have so far apparently produced a string of ceasefire agreements that have not been observed. But one quite interesting that's happened is that the Russian spokesman, Peskov, has set out a set of Russian negotiating aims, which are significantly less than what Putin has been saying for the last couple of weeks. He's not talking about the denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. He's talking about Ukraine and recognizing itself as neutral, about Ukraine recognizing Russian ownership of Crimea and so on. It's a more limited group. So there may be more significant things that will emerge from there, but I am not in the least bit optimistic about that. It seems to me that on both sides, the rhetoric is going up rather than down. And I'm afraid that looking forward, it all depends on the outcome of the war. Now, at the moment, the Russians are not doing well in the war. If they actually lose, which to my eyes may be becoming more and more of a probability, then we're going to have a very angry, inward-looking, humiliated Russia somehow to reintegrate into the world community. In a way, I find it very difficult to imagine how that is doable without the fall of Putin. If they win the war, that's obviously bad news. An aggressive war has been won. But it then leaves Russia with the job of occupying and controlling a vast country, the second largest in Europe, with 43 million people in it, most of them determined not to be ruled by the Russians, and the prospect of an ongoing insurrection for some time to come, and eventually again, I would expect, a Russian failure of some sort or another, bringing us back to the humiliated, revanchist, difficult Russia, which it is impossible to reaccommodate into the European normal life in the foreseeable future. And in either of those cases, what you're certainly going to see is a Russia which is already unhealthily dependent upon its links with China, becoming more so. So I'm afraid I find it very hard to be optimistic about where this is all taking us. So Tony, I wish you were wrong, but I suspect you're not. 
Thanks very much for joining us here on Planet Normal. Thank you. You know, Liam, it's one of the great privileges of being on Planet Normal. I think that we get people consistently of the calibre of Sir Tony Brenton to really delve down into these issues. And I hope listeners will feel as I do that I learned so much from hearing you two old Russia hands really exploring it. Less of the old co-pilot, less of the old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have young hands, do you? But you know, it's clear that the expansion of NATO, or at least the fear of the expansion of NATO, did threaten Putin and that his concerns were not taken seriously enough. And I think that, again, we're looking at the complacency and hubris of a, of a West, which perhaps simply thought this is the 21st century. We're not going back to that bad old stuff. But this, as you say, in, in every regard, it feels like we are back in the past. Something that interests me, he, Tony alluded it to it at the end, that there does seem a bit of a dilution in the Kremlin demands. They seem to be very much on a similar page to President Zelensky, who in an interview with ABC News a couple of days ago indicated that he is now prepared to accept that NATO won't take on Ukraine and that he has room for compromise over Donetsk, Lugansk and Crimea. So I'm wondering, A, whether this is now the basis of a ceasefire and because the Russians are getting bogged down quite literally. I don't know if you saw that the Ukrainians flooded the plains um, north of Kiev, so the tanks are really getting bogged down in there. But this is clearly, to me, the basis of a peace deal. And I suppose I wonder now, is Zelensky putting his population at risk unnecessarily by not suing for peace on this basis. What what do you think? I think there's something in that, Alison. I think Sir Tony did give us some real hard-nosed, real politic analysis of what's happening. But it may be that in the end, we get to a situation where eastern Ukraine is kept within Ukraine, but there's more autonomy, or eastern Ukraine is cut off completely from the rest of Ukraine. I thought it was very interesting that he said he doesn't feel that the West has taken Putin seriously enough over the years. He was very careful, as I will always be careful, to say, of course, none of that detracts in any way from the horror of the invasion and the completely unjustified aggression that Moscow is now using with all that humanitarian fallout that we discussed. But let me just say, before we go into emails, Alison, something that I've never said before. I think I've never really articulated this. I've certainly never written about it. Are you going to say you were wrong, co-pilot? No, 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 elegant no, capitulation, no, no. An, an unprecedented world event. Go on. What I was going to say <laughs> is that when I was in my mid-twenties, for all kinds of mad reasons, I was sitting in a room pretty much alone with the then Russian Prime Minister, Yegor Gaidar, wow. who was one of the main architects of Russia's post-communist reforms. And people like Yegor Gaidar, Boris Fedorov, Anatoly Chubais, who readers can look up, they are extremely historic, pivotal figures in post-communist Russia. And they risked their lives, literally their lives, to reform the Russian economy, to negotiate with the IMF, to make sure Russia didn't go back to communism, to unleash capitalism in Russia, however imperfect it was and is, those guys made sure that the communists and the deep conservatives, in the worst sense of that word, didn't gain the whip hand in post-communist Russia and take it back to a planned economy, take it back to a totalitarian dictatorship. Yegor Gaidar has huge admirers, the late Yegor Gaidar, across the Western world. And Yegor Gaidar said to me, you know what, Liam, the thing about this NATO expansion is the more you guys push it now, the harder you make it for me and other pro-Western, liberal, pro-market Russian leaders to fight back against the bad guys, the guys who operate in the dark, the guys who want Russia to become once again a totalitarian dictatorship. And that point of view, I think, had a great deal of merit at the time. And I think... As Tony Brenton articulated far better than I can 
that point of view was completely lost in the years which followed the collapse of the Soviet Union as post-communist Russia tried to make its way. Of course, Putin is a ghastly aggressor. Of course, it's going to be best for Russia if he isn't around, certainly as a leader in the near future. We'll see what happens. But I think Sir Tony Brenton's articulated a point of view which to many people will sound really distasteful at this point when we're watching bombs drop and we're seeing moving speeches by the president of Ukraine in the British Chamber of Parliament. But it is a point of view that needs to be considered if we are going to try and manufacture from this turmoil a sustainable and lasting peace in Europe. Before our listener emails Halligan, three most terrifying words of the week. You know what they are? <laughs> you owe money. I don't know. <laughs> Sir. Go on. Sir. Gavin. Williamson. Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> and passing over that almost Putinesque level of incredulous corruption. On to our fantastic listener emails on the subject of Ukraine. This is Julia. I am so fed up with all the morons who lecture Ukraine on its internal politics while justifying brutal Russian war. My sister and her children are under constant bombing near Kiev. I never know if our conversation would be the last one. And George says, this is a lovely email, Liam. My late father was Ukrainian. He adored this country, which took him in, defended him and his fellow Ukrainians and shone like a beacon of freedom during the Cold War. Britain has always been great, but that beacon has been relit in response to the depraved bloodlust of that child-murdering animal, Putin. I'm so proud of my own nation, Britain, for helping Ukraine, and I'm unbelievably proud of my own heritage when I see the heroic fight for freedom taking place in Ukraine. Previously, I had no time at all for Boris, but none of that matters now. In rising to the challenge, he has been greater than himself, and that deserves the highest praise. The only sniping we should be seeing now is the kind that eliminates Russian generals. Boris isn't my cup of tea, but he's our wartime leader, and people need to get behind him until every one of those Russian murderers has been driven out of Ukraine, and Putin, so obsessed with the judgment of history, meets the judgment of God. Children are being murdered as a matter of state policy. Support Boris now as he has supported Ukraine. Very powerful stuff. This is from Martha, Alison. That's not her real name. Martha writes, I wanted to let you know how much I've enjoyed and relied on the Planet Normal podcast since it began nearly two years ago. I know many listeners share my view and have let you know how vital it's been to feel we're not alone during such unprecedented times when we've been bombarded by establishment groupthink. I'm a nurse and right from the beginning... I felt mandatory lockdowns were unnecessary and only delayed transmission. If we think back to two years ago exactly, we were all adjusting our behaviour anyway, which is why transmission levels were already falling by the time the mandatory lockdown was announced. It was clear to me there was only going to be huge collateral damage from the restrictions and I became more certain of that as time went on. Anyway, it's strange that over the last two weeks, the pandemic has suddenly felt a very long time ago. News from Ukraine is heartbreaking and has refocused all our minds on how real danger can come out of the blue. My main reason for emailing is to ask you to please keep the podcast going. Your views and excellent guests are brilliant to listen to. I was so pleased to hear you're considering a live event. I'll definitely attend if that goes ahead. By the way, I listened to you read out Cheryl's email last week. That was another nurse. I read it out under another not her real name. There's so much I would like to tell you about my experience of working in the public sector organisation, says Martha, linked to the NHS over the last two years, but it's very difficult to do so whilst I'm still employed. Best wishes to you both and thanks so much for the podcast and for your articles. Oh, that's lovely. By the way, Liam, we're still getting a lot of emails about the situation of, of people in care homes. I know that Rights for Residents and John's campaign has taken the fight to Westminster this week. In fact, this very day, I believe, in a meeting with Gillian Keegan. So we're wishing those admirable campaigners all the best. Nikki says, I've been moved to write to you by the continued draconian COVID restrictions on care homes. I have two close family members in care. 
my mother with Alzheimer's and my sister with learning difficulties. While the rest of England enjoy new freedoms, the care homes are still subject to similar rules put in place during the height of COVID. Presumably, this is to make up for the shambles at the beginning of the pandemic when the government's directives resulted in unnecessary deaths. We eventually placed mum in care in September 2021, having cared for her on our own for two years. We felt the worst was over and any future restrictions on movement would be minimal. How wrong could we be? Her home, while very caring, has been subject to three lockdowns since she moved there. The last one still continuing and into its fourth week. I live very close to the home but have never been allowed to enter and at the moment while it is in lockdown I'm restricted to talking to mum through a window. She hasn't got a clue what's going on but is distressed she can't go out. My sister is equally distressed. She's now starting to go on days out but largely has to stick to open air places and hasn't been allowed to enter a shop for two years. Quite frankly, I despair. There's little point in my writing to someone in government, but I'm hoping by your continued drawing of attention to this matter, eventually it will dawn on those bureaucratic geniuses in charge of us that this can no longer continue. Well, be sure, Nikki, we're not going to rest on planet normal until we've got full access to all these elderly and disabled people in care. Well, Halligan, this is going to come as a huge surprise to you, but still overwhelming enthusiasm flooding in for our Planet Normal event in mid-May. I think we're going to need the Albert Hall at this stage. Sally says, Dear Alison and Leah, my husband and I have been on the rocket since the beginning. We would love to come and celebrate 100 episodes with you if we can. Keep up the good work. And Jane and Lisa from Cheshire say, My daughter and I are huge fans of Planet Normal. Never miss an episode. We'd love to attend a Planet Normal event. Just let us know when and where and we'll be there. And here to finish with are a couple of small insights, Halligan. Joey says, Whatever happened to COVID then? I've woken up with it this morning and it appears the world has moved on. It's like getting a pair of stay pressed trousers and everyone else is in Levi's 501s. We've got it in our house at the moment, Joey, so I feel your pain. And Perry says, say what you like about Vladimir Putin. You have to give him credit for ending the pandemic. Boom, boom. So that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reasoned views. Email of the week. It's my turn. It's got to be George. Do keep emailing us. We'll keep you updated on plans for that Planet Normal event soon. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampett, our editor, Zoe Hitch. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. 